I hope I deserve this. Truly, I do. I hope I'm wrong. Welcome back, everybody. Today we're talking about Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 5, The Bells. I'm really, really torn. I mean, on one side of the scale, you have some of the greatest action sequences ever assembled. On the other, bad storytelling, missed opportunity, and honestly, disgust. In my previous videos, I asked that everyone sit back and have faith in D&D, but perhaps I was wrong, and let's get into why. This episode can be broken down into two distinguishable portions, Before the Battle and The Battle. Before the Battle, we have the Varus plot and the Tyrion plot. During the Battle, well, we know what happens then. Before the official episode even begins, we're reminded in a unique recap of numerous bad quotes about Targaryens. The episode opens with Varus writing letters to the houses of the Seven Kingdoms that Jon is the true ruler. He's interrupted by a little girl who works in the kitchen, and I think based on the context of their conversation that he was trying to poison Danny, though it's left up to the viewer to determine. Next, we see Varus address Jon directly about being the one true king, and the line about uncertainty in Targaryens how it's akin to flipping a coin. One side a maniac, the other not. On the cusp of Daenerys about to burn millions alive, Varys commits treason more openly now, sending letters, talking directly. He's scared for these people, and rightfully so. Since we all know how this episode ends, I think it's safe to say that Varys was right. I mean, hell, Cersei was right, Jaime, everyone, all the evil people that opposed Danny were somehow the good guys trying to prevent this exact thing from happening. But let me stay on track. Tyrion tells on Varys, and the first time that we see Danny, I mean, she is a pro broken woman, upset with every single person in this chain that caused Varus to know this information to begin with. Something I want to point out is that they're trying to make her look like her brother in this instance, something that the audience relates to as, you know, a crazy Targaryen from our time. And it's honestly pretty well done. The haunting nature of the scene I loved because I didn't know if Danny was going to burn John, Tyrion, Varys, all of them. I mean, it was well done and suspenseful trying to guess the Mad Queen's next steps here. I think it's safe to say Tyrion sold his friend out to save face, and she reminds him a few moments later that this is your last chance. If you misstep one more time, you're done as well. They burn Varys alive, and right before, Tyrion admits that it was he that told Mom. It's a touching moment, for as silly as it is, because they could have just imprisoned him. I mean, Tyrion could have talked his way out of this, but alas, not enough time. Varys reacts like this when he touches him, because in the show, he's never been touched before. So this is a great moment, two friends saying their goodbyes. And I can't help but feel Tyrion should have voiced another route that they could consider. For him to plead with Danny as it became real and the moment comes to fruition. Perhaps burning people alive isn't the right method. However, maybe that was just foreshadowing what's to come. The person whose goals are the people of the realm being burned alive right before the people of the realm are burned alive. Something poetic about this, certainly, but man, Tyrion, if you cared this much, why not try to sway her once again? I don't think that it would have worked, right, given what she's gone through. I just feel that we should have had a scene with him trying to, and Danny condemning him for always sticking up for those not aligned with her getting the Iron Throne. And then she delivers the line about one more misstep. This would have better highlighted his willingness to allow bad things to happen, making him freeing Jaime make much more sense later on and just carry more weight overall. Instead, because of time, we just see Tyrion and Jon stand by while it happens. And credit to the cinematography and acting here. I mean, excellent, but I found myself not invested because... You know, boom, Varys dies a single episode after plotting for the good guy to be on the throne. Ultimately, Varys is dead, and he died doing what he did during life, plotting. So, let's move on. Another thing worth noting is that Danny calls out Sansa telling Tyrion in this scene that she knows who else betrayed her. And I pray that this does not mean that Sansa is on the chopping block as well. It's not the same as Tyrion or Jon, the other links of this chain. These two have a history now. And she views it as Sansa purposely manipulating her people to dethrone her. And I guess she's not wrong, but that's what I mean. Sansa could very well be in trouble here. With an episode left, I don't know if they'll speed things up or if Sansa will miraculously be there or, a, you know, what could happen, but she may go after Sansa. And that later could be a turning point in which Jon has to intervene. But again, let's go back before the battle. Tyrion tells Danny, Grey Worm, Jon, Davos, literally anyone that will listen to him to stop the attack once the bells ring. Three times it happens. 
It took only a single time for my wife and I to look at each other and go, okay, yeah, she's not stopping once those bells go off. And perhaps Tyrion knew that as well. And this repetitive nature is just, you know, him holding on by a thread to anything he can to save lives and ultimately it not working. Perhaps Tyrion knew that too, which brings us to this interaction between him and Jaime. This may be one of the most gut-wrenching moments of the episode. It's touching. It's mirroring previous encounters that Jamie had been locked up and freed, with Caitlyn Stark betraying Rob to save her girls and Tyrion betraying Danny to free his family. Jamie also freeing Tyrion previously. These two love meaningful conversations while the other is locked up. There's maybe something to explore there. But we're also reminded of Tyrion's terrible childhood and how without Jamie, he wouldn't have survived it. They love each other, which is what fucking blows my mind three seconds later when Tyrion's plan is for his brother to run back into the city that's about to blow up to save the sister that he hates. There are so many things wrong with this setup, and you can tell me that he cares about the fetus inside her belly because it resembles family or... Bah, 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 bah. Stop. Stop. I deserved a touching moment between these two before one of them died, and I couldn't even invest into the scene because Tyrion loves his brother most of all, and the safest spot humanly possible is to remain locked up exactly where he is during the battle. I mean, let's not even address how they completely ruined one of the greatest redemption arcs on planet Earth, and Jaime is here at all. But Tyrion was basically crushed by a giant shit wall of idiocracy. Tyrion cares for his family. He always has. That is his character flaw. But... That theory eats itself when the family member he loves most of all, as he proclaimed seconds ago, is given the order to run back into the city that's about to blow up because Cersei has a parasite in her stomach. Fuck, man. I'm disgusted that the interaction between them happened like this. We deserved so much better. And instead, we get him killing his own brother. That's what happened. He killed his own brother by sending him back into there. I mean, what? How? Why? Why was that the route they took? Let's move on before I have a brain aneurysm trying to figure out the logic of the smartest character in this show. <sighs> the battle begins. Excellent battle on the water. I wish that Euron would have died in defiance, though, trying with everything he could to kill the Mad Queen, and ultimately not leaving his ship until it was too late because his quest for power was far too great and it got the better of him. I guess instead, suddenly making him want to kill Jaime was a thing? I guess it wasn't all bad. The fight between them was nice. The way that Euron mocked him as a cripple and Jamie fought despite his wounds. It was a good fight, but good god was it forced. Unneeded screen time, in fact. Euron could have lived if not died like I just spoke about. They could have had a single shot at the end where they showed him being caught by Yara because he also did talk about leaving Cersei if things didn't pan out. Just have him dip out, get caught in a post credit scene, and Yara chain him up for months of torture. A sword fight with Jaime just doesn't make sense and was completely out of the blue. I'm the man who killed Jaime Lannister. The Golden Company turned out to be the worst Groupon deal in the history of Westeros, and all Scorpions somehow lost their ability to fire. I honestly thought Kyburn was dead here. Like, don't get me wrong, his death later was very good as well, but... These were his creation. She invested everything into these scorpions, and they failed to keep the city safe. I'm surprised Cersei didn't throw him out right then and there. And he delivers the line, The scorpions have all been destroyed, your grace. Far too calmly. I, I would be shaking if this were me. The ground troops advance, killing countless Lannister soldiers until we get to a crossroads, showing us that the people on the ground fighting this fight knew that the battle was done. They were aware of this threat, and seeing it realized caused them to give up before their queen ever signaled as much, though she never would have. Seeing them humanized right here, given faces and actions that set them as individuals that cherish their lives, was perfect, and made the ringing of the bells that much more haunting. The bells finally signal, and Danny starts having flashbacks to Vietnam or something, and, well, honestly, I couldn't tell you what she is doing right now. She clearly sees the giant building with the literal one person she wants to kill, and decides to zigzag across the millions of innocent where her own people are also fighting. It doesn't make any sense for so many reasons, none more asinine than the literal one person she needs to kill in the giant building sticking out across all the other buildings. She could have beelined for it and ended it. That was it. 
Another thing I want to point out is that the cinematic shots that we have here, I think that they're trying to show us the aspects of the two queens facing off at each other across a battlefield, for instance, meaning that Danny could have done all of this, killed all of these people, solely to make Cersei aware of her impending doom. However, while this would be justice for Cersei, she has more than earned her death by fire. They somehow decide that she just burns the city and Cersei dies under a pile of rocks, again making Cersei the good guy trying to stop a tyrant from killing killing millions. All things considered, what Cersei now is, is the person who spent an untold fortune to get additional troops across an ocean to protect her own people. I mean, what in the world? Why would they do this? Don't get me wrong, the writing was on the wall. My first video got a tidal wave of hate because I suggested that they're building Danny to this evil choice. Then another time I spoke about them stripping away everything that she loves and holds dear, showcasing a mental break that could cause this massive evil switch. But man, it should not have gone from breaker of chains, carer of the little people, to nearly genocide. Surely a step has to exist in between those. Again, not saying that this hasn't been built up. Part of me is happy that this happened. Danny hasn't been the best person ever. Threats of violence constantly needing to be told to be merciful, watching her brother die and not being sad. The breadcrumbs were loosely there. But she was never this. I do want to point out the overall good of this episode, and that as most of these episodes, has been beautiful imagery. The shots of the city being consumed by fire were excellent. Seeing the wildfire caches around the city blow up as she ignited everything else was absolutely stunning. It symbolized the link between her and her father, who was the one who ordered that wildfire to be placed there so many years ago. The fact that we're seeing them ignite now brings it full circle. The Mad King had a daughter that finished his work, and oh, that is that is honestly brilliant. It's good. And the map room that Jamie and Cersei hugged in as the room crumbled around, showing the end of the Lannister rule over this world. Also, a beautiful shot with great symbolism. The mountain killing Kyburn, the callback to the idea of Frankenstein being killed by his monster. Well done, and only outdone by Cersei hastily walking past the two brothers with great comedic effect. This makes sense because the Hound knows that everyone in this building is dead. He just doesn't care. He wants to see one person die, and that's his brother. Which also brings us to Clegane Bowl. We finally get it, and it was great. Sandor pushing his brother into the fire just like the mountain did to him as a child. I still wish that Arya would have run back and saved him, perhaps weakening the mountain so that Sandor could kill him somehow. But this was not bad by any means. Though seeing him turn her away right before they got to that exact moment, that was a gut punch. Perhaps because I was so close to seeing my prediction about this fight come true. Perhaps because it means that Arya came to King's Landing for literally no reason, just so that we could see the perspective of the people during battle. The mind-numbing carnage from a single character. But this could have also been expertly done by following a nameless person around as they try to save their friends and family. Perhaps them dying at the end of this, which... Part of me kind of hopes that Arya did, just to show what is happening in the city. They also did the trick where it showed her getting into an inescapable circumstance over and over, which was one of the main reasons that people didn't like the Long Night. You know, she was killed here and here and here and and then uh, rode a horse out. Right now, as it stands, she rode all the way south just to be told by Sandor that a life of killing just isn't the way. So what, is she not a killer now? Does she just go back and become the Lady of Storm's End? Is that actually what happens? I mean, they messed up Jamie's arc. I... Please, please don't do that. Please, please. In a way, she stripped Jon from being the one who gives the killing blow to the Night King. And no way that she kills Danny now. As much as the show tries to make it clear that Danny has green eyes in these previous episodes, this will not be the game of Arya. Or perhaps... Arya of Thrones? She doesn't kill all the bad guys, I'm sure of it. I'm, at least I'm pretty sure of it. Which means that it must be up to Jon or Tyrion. Though my money is on Jon, because otherwise he also doesn't have a purpose. He is the rightful ruler, and he has proven countless times why he would be best suited to rule. Though my hopes are high, I feel disappointment will be falling on me next Sunday, where he somehow says, no, I don't want the throne, and this time, of all times, it actually means something, when all the previous times that it hasn't. All the times that Danny said it wouldn't matter, all the times that we've seen it not matter, he will finally be in a position to be the ruler of Westeros, and this will be the first time that he says no, and it sticks, which makes me utterly sick to my stomach 
stomach for so many bad choices that have been made at the end of this series, but I guess that's for next week. In summary, I'm disgusted that so many bad storytelling decisions were made. I'm happy to be watching Game of Thrones and to be covering it, and that it was funded, period, because we've gotten some of the most insane storytelling up to this point, and still some of the most insane, beautiful moments that television can offer. Lastly, I'm expecting disappointment next week, just so when it happens, I'm already prepared. And with that, the end of this video. If you felt that I was too hard on the show, or if you felt that I was too soft on the show, let me know what you think in the comments below. Positive Outlook Hacks Dogma is basically taking a backseat in light of this episode, but don't let this hamper your experience if you enjoyed it. Your opinions are valid, and fuck anyone that tries to tell you differently, whether you liked this episode, whether you didn't. Thanks for watching, guys. If you want to support content like this, please consider joining Patreon and this month's donators who make this content possible, Chris Cole and Michael Link. Much love, everybody, and I can't wait to talk to you all again very soon.